Well, good morning. My name is Daryl. I get to be part of the team here. It is a true privilege to come and worship with you guys and be part of, of what God is doing here in beautiful Seabree. Whether we're joining you online or you're here, welcome. So I want to play a game. It's a short game, but a game nonetheless. I'm going to show a picture of a wrapped gift, and I want you to please, and I know it's going to be hard, okay? I want you to, don't, you know, don't just shout out the answer, but... I want you to guess what you think the gift that's wrapped could possibly be, okay? All right, so here's the first picture. Here we go. Ready? Wait for it. What in the world do we think this gift is? This is it. What could it be? Football. <laughs> right? That's absolutely the new Xbox. I'm excited. This kid's going to be happy, okay? Uh, how about this one? Definitely absolutely. Yeah. This is the new doll for Susan. I don't know, right? Is that for me? <laughs> no, this next one's for me, though. How about this one? <laughs> I love car commercials this time of year where, you know, they go out in the driveway, there's just this, you know, if you don't know how to wrap something, just slap a bow on it. I'm like, perfect. By the way, if this is something you have, feel free to park it right over here. Put the bow on. I'll be happy to take the bow off. Then we're going to leave the keys in it, and we'll be good. Just for the record, that's a Cadillac. Okay? All right. Okay, now, let me change the rules a little bit. What if I were to show you, say, the wrapping paper? Or maybe the container that the gift was in? Do you think you could guess what the gift was? All right, let me show you the paper, or the wrapping, first. Maybe something, maybe a little something like this. Okay? And then what if we, that your gift was placed in this? Would you recognize it? Because I dare say none of us really would. Would you recognize that the gift that was wrapped in linen, maybe like that, and placed in a manger, possibly like this, was the greatest gift ever given? There is absolutely nothing in the wrapping or in the container that would be that would belie the magnitude of the gift. So we turn to Luke chapter 2, to the very well-known passage that we know, that we know that I've read a hundred times. And read with me Luke chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 4. And as we do so, I want to answer three questions, or I want to approach this topic or this passage answering three things. The who, the where, and the why. So read with me chapter 2. The book of Luke. We'll start in four. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to, Ju to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to, to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes, cloths, and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Okay? So, first, the who. I know you guys know who, the, we understand this passage. This passage is the, the who of this story, although we've talked about Mary a few weeks past. We've talked about Joseph a few weeks past. Last week, Robert led us in a discussion on, on the, the Magi and the shepherds that came. The who of this story of all of these is the central character of Jesus, isn't it? A few verses later, we've read that you know this, that when it came time, when it came time for Jesus to be circumcised in the eighth day, they named him Jesus. So this firstborn son, born to Mary, who is pledged to be married to Joseph, is Jesus. Jesus, this baby, infant, child, born into this world like every other child born. Right? And, and this who that we need to understand is, is absolutely a baby boy. Right? There's no denying this. Just like, I don't know, uh, Abel 
or Abraham, or I don't know, pick anyone, you, myself. Just as we were born, Jesus was born. What does that mean? It means Jesus, the who, is a baby, human, infant, boy. There's a subtle danger, though, when we become familiar with the story of the when we become familiar with the Christmas story, isn't there? We think of Christmas, we think of what? A baby boy. That is a good thing to think. It's an appropriate response. Because Scripture points us here. Luke says, listen, I need you to understand something. Mary had a son, and his son, who we know as miraculous conceived, was a boy. But is that all who Jesus is? book of John, the Gospel of John, you guys remember, you can turn there, a few pages over, starts off, in verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word. Now we know, and we know that this Word is a, is a name for Jesus, and it's an expression of Jesus the Christ. Because Jesus is the full expression, the complete expression of God. It is God's Word incarnate. Jesus, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God. So, the Word, Jesus, was with God Almighty. What else does it say? And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were created, were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made, and in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John, opening line is, listen, this child that we are going to, this person, this Jesus that we're going to speak of, that I'm going to write about, is the one who was with God and is God. Verse 14, jump down to verse 14. The Word, what? Became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. My prayer, my goal, and I feel woefully inadequate on this, is to pull our attention to see the manger in its fullness today. Maybe it would be helpful if we look at the end. This is going to be unusual, but look, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter Revelation chapter 4, as you know, is a picture of the throne of heaven. And it's going to use a lot of imagery that may be like, wow, I don't, that just sounds bizarre and fantastic. And yeah, it is. But I need us to, to look past what we may not understand or may be a little confusing or maybe a little fantastic because I want us to see the tone and the majesty of what's going on in heaven. We'll start in one. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and in the voice I had heard, um, first heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once in the Spirit, and at once I was in the Spirit, and before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated in them were 24 elders, and they dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the, and from the throne, listen to this, came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing, and these are the seven um, spirits of God. Also in front of the throne were was what looked like a sea of glass clear as crystal. 
Oh, but in the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back, and the first living creatures was like a lion, and the second was like an ox, and the third was like a man, and the fourth was like a flying angel, and each of these four living creatures had six wings, covered with eyes around them, and under its wings lay day and, and but listen to what they did, and day and night they never stopped saying what? What did they say? Day and night, what did they do? What was their response to the one seated on the throne in heaven? Their response was, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fell down before him who sits on the throne and worshiped him whose lit lives were forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they are, were created and have their being. Can you picture a little bit? Is this just a little, oh, look at the little scene. I got a few angels flying around, singing a few songs. No, what's going on here? God Almighty in His majesty and in His power, peals of thunder are rolling through heaven. And all these creatures are bowing down and their only response that they can even kind of come up with that is an appropriate response to this is to say, holy, holy, holy. Chapter 5. And then I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne of the, of the scroll. Who sits at the right hand of the throne of God? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. With writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaim in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Who has the authority to break the seals that God has placed? Only God. <laughs> it says, But no one in heaven and earth is under the earth is to open the, the scroll or even look inside of it. I wept because no one has found who is worthy. Do not weep further down. It says, see, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Boy, that, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing where? At the center of the throne. Who sits at the center of the throne of God? God himself. This Jesus sitting at the center of the throne is circled by the, these four living creatures mentioned before and the elders. And the Lamb had seven horns and eyes and seven spirits, and the God sent out all the earth. He went and took, took the scroll from the right hand of him, sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders bowed down, bowed down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp and incense, which are the prayers, the bowl full of incense, and the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song. What was their response? You... Jesus, are worthy to take the scroll and open its seal because you were slain and your blood you purchased for, with your blood you purchased for God. Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. <laughs> and then I looked, and then I looked, he says, and I heard a voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousands. These angels encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. <laughs> and then I heard every creature, every creature in, on he in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. This is the picture the Bible paints. It just, if we just peel the, the, the veil of heaven back and we can look into the throne room of God, this is what it is. This is God the Father and God the Son. God, unity, the, the, the trinity. And all of these creatures that we can barely even... I mean, you know John's just like, okay, it had this and it was like this and it, it was like a crystal sea, but it was even better. We know it's better than that, right? And so like, what... 
And they're bowing down and they're worshiping. They all power, all glory, all that, everything is yours. Now, if you will, turn back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Jesus is approaching the cross. He's hours away from the cross, literally. And he's praying. And he's praying to his Father. John 17, verse 1. It says, And Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he may give eternal life to all those who have been given him. You have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jesus continues, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And look at verse 5. And now, Father... Glorify me in your presence with the glory, what? The glory I had with you before the world began. So Jesus is praying to the Father, and he says, God, glorify me with the glory I had for eternity past. The glory I had, that is his prayer. In no way, shape, or form is it a selfish prayer. It is simply one, God, I've done your will, Father, I've done your will. Now restore me to my rightful place. Isn't the book of Revelation, what we just read, really just an answer to Jesus' prayer? Oh, there's absolutely an aspect or a component that, that the exaltation of Christ and Christ seating at the right hand of the throne of God is a response, is the appropriate response of God the Father to, his, to the Son for his obedience, or obedience of even death on a cross. But is Jesus any less or any more glorious than he was for eternity past? No, because he is God eternal, God Almighty, Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings forever, right? The reason I reread this is because once we get that a little bit better, a little bit clearer picture in our head, once we understand who Jesus is, now when you look to Luke chapter 2 and we see this, this infant boy wrapped in some linen cloth, placed in a manger, in a trough, what? God only shares his, God shares his glory with no one. Because no one's worthy to share his glory. And yet Revelations 4 and 5 and, 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 and John chapter 17 and John chapter 1, they all paint the picture. They all tell us that Jesus being God is the glorious one to be worshipped forever and ever because he is God in every single way. When, when the, before the universe was even began, who was there? Jesus. It is by whose words was all of creation created? It was Jesus. When, when, Lord, when God said, let there be, who was speaking? The baby boy laying in a manger. Yeah. Furthermore, where? Where is this <laughs> incarnation occurring? Where is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords arriving? <laughs> is, is, is he arriving in, 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 in like a chariot and in, in pomp and circumstances? Is he arriving in the, the power center of the of the known world? Is he no where is he's arriving in the backwater town of a no name? I mean, like what? Bethlehem? There ain't nothing there. Is he even arriving? Is it even showing up in like a palace in Bethlehem? 
Maybe Bethlehem's got a millionaire row or something, and there's this regal home, and, and no. Where is he showing up? In, 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 a, in a probably either in a, some people say a cave, and some people say a building with the with the with the rooms upstairs, and then down below is where the livestock and the animals lived. I'm inclined to that one myself. There's no room upstairs, so where is this baby born? To who is he born? Would we ever know the names of Mary and Joseph? Would history have ever recorded the name Mary or Joseph? Had it not been for Christ? No. This young virgin woman who never even like who? Joseph? Sure, they were both they were both they of the the royal line of David, but by this point, the royal line of David was, you know, like, okay. Joseph is just a common carpenter. He's not a king. He's not a prince. He's not a whatever. You know, what is his dad do? Probably a carpenter. What was it? Probably a carpenter. You know, like, what do you, you know, what's her grandson going to do? It'll probably be a carpenter, right? You, there's no, there's nothing that would point to the, you know what, the king of kings, the lord of lords is. Is Jesus, what is Jesus wrapped in? What is he born? Is he wrapped in fine linens? Maybe royal purple cloths and maybe fringes of gold. No. Is he placed in some opulent, gorgeous, beautiful, carved, wonderful, ornate crib? Is there a gaggle, and I mean like a ton of servants running around making sure that the birth is safe, everything's going to go okay? Is this, you know, is this the birthing center of the first century that Jesus is born into? No. Where is he born? Where does God choose to incarnate himself to be one of us? Like this. A picture of major again. This is where. They did not put these in the Hiltons. <laughs> where did they put these things? Where the animals were. Shoo them away. Clean them out. We need this. God Almighty, the one who all these creatures bow down and worship day and night, holy, holy, holy. God Almighty, who say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. This, he was born in a place with the smell of manure and wet hay. Why don't you guess what it was wet with? Maybe, maybe they could even hear the people uh, living upstairs. And here they are downstairs. And poor Mary giving birth in this setting. You think this is where she wanted to give birth? Well, I guarantee she'd rather be around her family. Oh no, it's here. There's no room. So it's here. She lays the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Creator of all, Stone major. In fact, everything that's going this is this is so obscure, so not common, that's not the right word. It's so the people upstairs didn't even know what was going on, did they? It took an angelic announcement to let the shepherds who were nearby know what was going on, right? <laughs> The King of Kings and Lord of Lords has arrived on earth and, it, and nobody would know except for maybe Mary and Joseph. Except for the divine revelation of God to people say, hey, hey, just in case you missed it, by the way, and the Savior's born. I want you to go to the town of Bethlehem. You're going to find him not in the opulent setting. Not if He's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. And, go there. 
And the Magi, I mean, they had Apollo a star. Like, what is that? Right? Otherwise, now we get to the why. Why did Jesus, why here? Why did God become one of us? Why did God take on humanity? By the way, this is in my notes. What is, you guys realize what that means? Think of it. Except for our sinful nature, Jesus, God himself, took on everything that it means to be human. Within six hours, I guarantee you, every single one of us are going to start to get hungry, right? Me? I'll give it another 15 minutes. Right? God Almighty, creator of the universe, <clears throat> hungry? Uh, let's say you were a carpenter, and you go out and you start schlepping wood and drywall or whatever, and you, you know, in the heat of a summer day and out in the sun, what do you do? You sweat. And it's uncomfortable. It's annoying and it's hard. The beams are heavy. <laughs> God Almighty. The omnipotent one? This beam is heavy. Rejected. Misunderstood. Lied to. Betrayed. Yeah. Back to my notes. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you remember this, uh, reminds us why Jesus came. When the angel tells Joseph who this child is to be, he calls. He said, he will save his people from their sins. Luke chapter 2, further on, as, a, as we, if you continue on reading it, the passage after the passage we started off with, the angel announces that a Savior has come. Saviors do what? They save. Why did Jesus came come? Jesus came to save. No better, no, nowhere else better put than John chapter 3, verse 16. Why did Jesus come? Why did the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who sits enthroned, descend, condescend down to us? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Furthermore, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but what? To save the world through him. Take out the word world and slap your name right there. Why did Jesus, <laughs> the glorious God, become an infant baby boy in a manger so that he could save you and me. In short, he came because it was the will of the Father. In short, he came because he loves you and me. He loves us. In short, he came to give life, to give eternal life, as we've read in the book of Revelation as well, in 1 John. He came to die on the cross on our behalf. That's why. Here's my point. The birth of Jesus rightly shows, as we've looked at in the various previous weeks, as we've looked at the various prophecies that God has fulfilled through the, through the, the birth of Jesus, the birth of Jesus rightly shows the faithfulness of God to his word and to his promise, does it not? When we look at, the, when we look at the, the manger scene and we read the, the birth narratives in the Bible, we recognize the countless prophecies fulfilled, which all, I mean, they're just showing one who Jesus is, but they show the faithfulness of God. The birth of Jesus, properly understood as glorious, almighty creator God, to whom all creation bows in worship, enthroned in heaven and in all authority, begins to show also... 
the extent that God will go to to save you and me. When we recognize who Jesus is and how far he is willing to go, I look at Jesus, the infant boy. Oh, sure, it's a cute, cuddly baby. But all I can see is the love of God. Because every part of this story should jolt our sensibilities. Bethlehem? Really? A manger? Mary? Baby? Jolt her sensibilities. The God of the universe. Furthermore, we know that that's just the beginning of the extent of God's love, isn't it? The fullness of God's love came about 30, 33 years later, didn't it? Because that child grew to be a man and he lived a perfect life. And although he was blameless and although he was sinless, he died a sinner's guilty death on a cross. Oh, that's humiliation, isn't it? The humiliation of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords coming to be one of us. And then to die on our behalf. For me, for you. <laughs> that shows the full extent. The full work on our behalf. Because why did Jesus come? He came to rescue you, to rescue me. But how did we accept God's gift of creation and fellowship and presence with God in the Garden of Eden? How did we accept that gift he gave? We spit in his face, we being humanity. Right? In fact, the Philippians tells us that, that Jesus did not consider, did not grasp hold of the glory that is rightly his as King of kings and Lord of lords. He did not hold on to it for his own selfish gain, but what did he do? He let go to become one of us. And yet in the garden, what did we do as mankind? We decided, hey, I want to grasp onto the glory of God and I want to be like God. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, that's how we accept Trent. How did we accept his gift of rescue from slavery and Pharaoh in Egypt? <laughs> Humanity said, no, I want to go back. How did we accept his free gift of the law and the Ten Commandments and, and how we can once again have a relationship with God through the, through the sacrificial system? How did we accept that? Before, before he even came down from the rumbling mountain, what did, they, what did we as mankind do? Built our own little God to worship in a little golden calf. Literally, the mountain's there. The glory is there. The, I mean, it's shaking and trembling and... Oh, he's taking too long. We need our own God. How did mankind, how did we accept God's gift of his direct rule and presence and rulership over our lives? We said, no, I want a king like the other nations. I don't want to be led by you, God. No, I want to be led by a king that we can choose. Really? How did we accept God's gift of his son? Did we recognize him as, as the, the inauguration of the kingdom of God that has begun and we bow down and worship and submission to him? No, what did we do? Put him on a cross. Willfully chose to crucify him, verse, over the guilty one. Make no mistake about it, by the way. It was Jesus' willful choice to allow that to happen on our behalf. But we put him on Now, what's striking to me is, nonetheless, that's what I have emboldened on my notes, the word nonetheless. Nonetheless, even though every gracious gift God has given from the beginning of time to his, to his, to his image bearers, to his children, 
But nonetheless, in spite of, despite how they ex didn't accept those gifts, nonetheless, in full knowledge, Jesus became the incarnate Son of God who came. Born of a virgin to rescue his people whose sin, <laughs> whose sin compared to the holiness of God, because remember, he's holy, 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 <clears throat> whose sin, he came to rescue the people whose sin compared to his holiness is infinitely more offensive than the manure that he was born feet from. He came. The Lord of glory came here. And that is good news. So, lastly, what is our response? Each week we were looking at this. And the response. <laughs> what is our response to this? Is our response to sing a few songs and think, oh, maybe Jesus, how cute. How cuddly. Oh, this story just gives me the feels. All the good feels. <laughs> Only to miss the magnitude of the manger. Is our response to ignore the King of Kings who came, to ignore him through ritual, or to ignore him through traditions, to ignore him through party, ignore him through consumerism? We can ignore him all six ways to Friday, can't we? Or maybe, maybe a little more accurately, maybe not ignore him, but just be distracted. Is that our response? To the God of all glory and majesty and power? Or is our response to accept the gift of salvation that he offers. To believe in him for our salvation, to repent of our sin, to cry out to him to save us, and to receive the gift of eternal life that he came to give. Is our response to recognize, particularly as Christ followers, that Jesus, as God who came and dwelt among us, is to recognize him, and as we open our gifts, is our response as we open our gifts, as we eat our meals of celebration, which are all good things, as we go about our last-minute shopping, whether that's clicking or whether that's walking, I don't know, as we go about and we make phone calls and we visit family, or as we're driving in the car, or as we're waiting for that pie to bake, or as we're sweeping the floors to get ready for company, is our response to bow down and sing with all of creation, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forevermore. May that be our natural, continuous response as we look at the Christmas story celebrate this time. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, it is all too easy to get distracted. It is all too easy to forget. It is all too easy to diminish the extent of what you've done on our behalf. We can get caught up in the cuteness. We can get caught up in the traditions. We can get caught up in the ritual and lose and lose what? And lose sight of all that you've done. Lose sight of who you are and the extent that you came to save us. So God, we do recognize that your love for us and all we can say is thank you and all we can say is God, you are alone, are worthy. It is to you who sit on the throne that you are to be praised and honored in glory and power forever. In Jesus' name.